And the winner is edible flowers. Welcome to Gardening Australia. A little later on, I'll be walking you through some of my favourites. But first, let's see what the rest of the team is up to. Hmm, looks good. Gourds are amazing things. They come in such a diverse range of shapes, colours and sizes. But they're not just ornamental. They can be useful too. I'm going to show you how to make a gourd planter. I'll show you how easy it is to propagate cassava, one of the toughest and most dependable crops in my garden. Recently, Evergreen Peter Cundall had a 90th birthday. Hundreds of people turned up here at the patch to celebrate it with him. And I was lucky enough to have a chat. <laughs> when you're designing a garden for an established home, you're rarely dealing with a blank canvas. There's nearly always an established tree, maybe a shed, perhaps a driveway to deal with. And in this particular case, the clients wanted some sculptures included in their garden. Yes, it's a great plant. Quite, yeah, Lisa Ellis great. is a very experienced garden designer. Here she has used the client's sculptures in a delightful, playful way. I'd never had a brief where I was asked to design a garden for livestock. The sheep themselves were made by women in the ghettos in South Africa. They're quite ornate. I think it was important to put together a planting palette, a, a garden design that made them the hero, but by the same token, setting the stage for them and creating even what might, some people might see as being a wonderland. Lisa has cleverly used cushion bush under the sculptures. Its mounding habit makes an undulating meadow for the sheep to graze. I notice when it comes to planting, you've assembled plants in odd numbers. You've got three of those box there, three liriodendron. I find planting in odd numbers, three, five, and seven, the best way to go, don't you? Absolutely. Using odd numbers, it seems like a, a paradox, but it g creates a great sense of balance. Lisa has created an incredibly rich texture by making effective and appropriate plant choices. We were keen to use a really rich tapestry of foliage rather than flowers. The client said from the outset that they were keener on a garden that had textural interest rather than too many flowers. And the other thought too was that we used quite a number of greys and greens that would complement the facade of the Art Deco residence. What's this plant down here? Oh, John, this is a favourite. This is Alcamilla mollus. Beautiful foliage. You can just see how the dew um, presents itself on the leaves. Oh, yeah, it's it looks so great. beautiful. And I love those acid, sort of sulphur yellow flowers. And down here, now this isn't an ordinary stachys, is it? I'm looking no. at something that's a bit different there. That is called stachys big ears. It's a cultivar with, you know, particularly large leaves and works really well here. I think it's quite rich. Oh, yeah. And then as we move along, you introduce some nice variegation. I used to think variegation was quite vulgar, but look, I've turned my prejudices on their head and now I use cream variegation quite often to bring a sparkle and a lightness to the garden. I think that works really well when, when foliage is the key driver in a planting design. And last of all, I suppose, there's this marvellous catmint. It's such an ebullient plant, isn't it? It certainly is. Look, catmint is always a most obliging plant. Flowers from early spring to late autumn and the bees, of course, love it. When space is at a premium, it's a good idea to think outside the square. The driveway actually extended along the side of the house and right down to the garage at the back of the block. And I proposed to the clients the idea of lifting all the red bricks and turning this into a beautiful maple walk. I think this is really great. I love the trees and it's beautifully cool too. Indeed, look, it's really improved the outlook from within the house yeah. and has also helped anchor the house on the block. Well, I think it's an inspired little space because it's not big, it's linear. You've broken it up by curving the path through it so you don't see right through it. And these, what are they, Ace of Vitifolium, are the perfect scale for the space. What else have you got in here? This looks to me like sarcococca. It is. Sarcococca is a fantastic plant for shady spots. We've also used a dwarf liriope, liriope samantha. Yep. And also a favourite, Viola labradorica, labrador and, violet. Yeah, and it's, it's filled every piece of space. So effectively, it's just a continuum of greenery. Indeed it is. It's magical. Mm. Beautiful lush carpet around the blue stone. It's fair to say that Lisa's approach is very much less is more. And she has some great small garden tips. The 
many home gardeners try and use too many species in their garden. They put too many plants in and it can look busy and crowded. A really great tip is in fact to mass plant the same species and the overall effect is much more pleasing and spacious. Another tip for the home gardener is to paint paling fences a dark colour. I believe when the fences are a dark colour, it actually amplifies the greenery and it, it turns the garden into a theatre set. Use upright columnar trees like this one, Liriodendron tulipifera fastigiata. They make the garden feel a lot more spacious. When it comes to your own place, you may want to do it all yourself. Remember though, just a couple of hours spent with a designer can save you time and money in the long run. People often ask me, how do I know what flowers are safe to eat? Well, there's no real rule of thumb to determine whether a flower is edible or not. So my advice is stick to tried and true delicious favourites when it comes to picking flowers to eat. Let's have a look at a couple of my favourites. There's so many great edible flowers to choose from. The first one I want to share with you is good old nasturtium. It grows rampantly and you can eat the flowers. The other thing to note with the nasturtium is the flower becomes a seed pod which you can actually pickle like a caper. Native violets are such a useful plant to have in the garden. They form a great ground cover in areas where there's low light, but anywhere where you just want to cover the ground and reduce your weed and your maintenance. Of course, edible flower, as is the good old viola or violet itself. Perfect for pots, lots of colour, and you can toss them on the top of a salad for an interesting taste. Portulaca is another great edible flower that you can grow in the garden. It's actually known as purslane, and the Mediterraneans, us Greeks, have been eating it for years in salad. So you can eat the little leaves or you can sprinkle the flowers on the top of a salad as well. Either way, worth giving it a go. Everyone knows marigolds as classic pot plants and border plants, but why not cross the border and take these wonderful coloured flowers into the kitchen. The flowers themselves are quite bitter, so it's a perfect opportunity to complement the sweetness of stewed or poached fruit with the bitterness of the flowers sprinkled on the top to bring it to life. Now, rose bushes, as a rule, are either grown for fragrance or as colour. The fragrant ones are the ones that I want to look into as something that could infuse into a drink or maybe even in a, in a sauce to put over a dessert. As far as I'm concerned now, I think it's time to go and explore the idea of creating maybe a cocktail or a drink that's got some rose petals, a bit of uh, marigold in it, some nasturtium for pepper, a little bit of viola on the top for, for colour. I reckon that's going to go well. Getting sick can be stressful, but the places we seek treatment can also be stressful. This rooftop garden in Sydney's Darlinghurst is all about improving wellbeing. It's for patients and staff at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. The 155 square metre space on the top of the Kinghorn building was completed in 2012. The team commissioned to make it, including landscape designer Daniel Bafsky, were inspired by their research into the relationship between healing and access to nature. We read a lot and the evidence-based design actually suggests that people will um, heal faster and leave hospitals quicker, which is good on so many levels. I think th that, that understanding is almost 100 years old, you know. In the old days uh, in hospitals, people were wheeled out into the sunshine. Um, hospitals were in greenfield developments. It's a little bit different in an urban environment, obviously, but I think, you know, on a subconscious level, uh, everyone who loves gardens, you know, knows that it has that power. And engaging the senses is the key to that healing power. So, sight, light and shade. So the trees, the dappled light of the birches is really beautiful in the space and, and that sets the tone. Um, flower colour, obviously, 
uh, the Plectranthus Mona lavender, the Ligularia has a yellow flower. Tactility is sort of derived from a few different things. Plants themselves are tactile and we've planted herbs quite next to the seats so that people can sort of reach over and touch them and, and induce that smell as well as their tactility. Sound, obviously in an urban environment like this, uh, there's a road right below um, and just the ambient noise of the city. Water played an important part in buffering that noise, but it's also important for tactility as well. This is one of my other favourite features here, Daniel. Yeah. Tell me about the papyrus. Well, that's, uh, that was chosen for quite a few different reasons. Obviously, we wanted to screen and give some privacy for staff and for um, patients, but to have something that was going to blow in the wind and um, get that western sun. So interesting, the way that this is being cast. What gave you the idea for the shape and the form of, of this? The design of it's quite functional. I mean, we started with the idea that, you know, we wanted to have an element that responded to the architecture, obviously, um, and to interpret it in a different way. It's just beautiful. Very tactile, cooling. Yeah, so <laughs> Jane Wiggers de Vries is a theatre nurse here and a recovered patient. Yeah, so I was 24 and I was diagnosed with very aggressive breast cancer. For one minute, you know, I'm a healthy, happy 24 year old, loving my job, you know, working in the operating theatres as a registered nurse, living my life with my boyfriend, and then all of a sudden I've gone into this room with the oncologist and she said, you're going to be menopausal, you might lose your fertility, you're going to lose your breasts, unfortunately you're going to lose all your hair and you're going to go through all these symptoms and now I don't feel like a 24 year old anymore and it was very quick and it was heartbreaking. Jane continued to work throughout her treatment. Like, at one moment, I would be holding my patient's hand, encouraging them and making them feel better before their operation, but then I would be like, all right, hold on, and then I would run downstairs, get my, you know, rip off my scrubs and get my own radiotherapy, and then come back to work. She came to this garden whenever she could. It's a place to get away and it was a place where you could forget where you are, where you're situated. I would be waiting for my oncology appointment, sitting around all the sick patients, and then I found out the doctor was running behind, so I came up here to sit, and you could just sit here and forget about everything that's going on. And do you have favourite parts in the garden? Definitely just having the water flowing and it drowns out, you know, that you're in the middle of the city in Darlinghurst. And it brings me back to feeling like I'm back home in the Blue Mountains, almost. Daniel was thrilled to meet someone who's used the space he helped to create nice in exactly you, the Daniel. way he'd That's hoped. A, a special opportunity oh, it's to be able nice. to talk with you yeah. um, and get some feedback about the garden. This garden meant so much to me. I was going through my cancer treatment here and every time that I would have a stressful doctor's appointment or something, you could come up here and um, take that time to distract yourself and forget about everything that's going on and just stop. And you can be distracted by the water, the plants, the trees. And I think if that's letting patients do that or staff, I think that's reached the goal of the garden. Unfortunately, Jane has been further diagnosed with secondary breast cancer. This special garden continues to provide her and the other patients at Kinghorn with peace and solace during their treatment, and we wish them all a speedy recovery. No matter what happens to the other vegetable crops in my garden, I can always depend on cassava. It's one of the most versatile, adaptable and drought-resistant crops you can grow. The high-protein leaves are delicious when they're young, but it's the starchy tubers that are the main attraction. They can be eaten like potatoes, turned into flour, or combined with coconut milk to make a great tapioca. 
But before you eat cassava, you've got to prepare it. It contains cyanide. Now, this isn't any more scary than a green potato or a green pineapple. With the leaves, you boil them for 10 minutes, and with the roots, you boil them for 20 minutes, after which they're safe and lovely to eat. Propagating cassava is dead easy. It's just important to choose the right propagating material. This old grey wood is perfect. This green wood will probably rot during the propagation process. So you just prepare cuttings about 30 centimetres long, so just a couple here. All these buds along the stem, they will produce individual plants. Half fill a styrofoam box with some potting mix, lay the cuttings horizontally on top, and then cover with some more potting mix. And finally, keep the cuttings damp. When the roots start coming out of the bottom of the box, that's your cue to lift the cuttings, separate them into individual plants, and then plant them out. And this technique will guarantee an all-year-round supply of cassava. I've shown you New Guinea beans before. I love to grow them because they're a great tasting vegetable, but they're sometimes called an edible gourd. I also grow true gourds for ornamental purposes only, not for eating. They're lots of fun and can be used for craft projects like these really cute chooks. These have been painted and varnished. Or for musical instruments. Or in many parts of the world, they're used for practical purposes, such as vessels for food or water storage. Now, I'm growing five varieties here. This one's called Crown of Thorns and looks a bit like a squash. This one here is Club Warty, and you can see why. I'm also growing a Round Warty on the other side of the shed. This one's called a Bottle Gourd, for obvious reasons, and this big whopper is called the Bushels Basket, and I reckon it weighs about 15 kilos. Now, you grow gourds very similarly to growing pumpkins. You sow seeds into warm soil in springtime. But one of the things I love is that these varieties, these big ones, actually are very vigorous vines and can be used to shade a wall, as they are here, or even over a strong pergola. As far as when to harvest them, you actually have to wait till the vine dies back completely because you want all the goodness from the leaf to go into the gourd. Then you pick them with a piece of stem attached and dry them in a cool place, like a shed or veranda, and that's going to take many months. Take a look at these. Once you start growing gourds, it's a bit addictive. This is a group sold as a decorative mix and they've just been harvested. I love the bright colours and just a bowl of them on the table looks fantastic. I grew the same last year and this is how they dry. They lose their colour but they still look fantastic and there's lots of different sorts to choose from. I'm going to show you how to make a decorative planter out of one of these. A dried bottle gourd. I've just put a couple of holes in the bottom for drainage and now I'm going to mark where I'm going to put a hole in the side to get the potting mix in. I'm just going to use a little craft saw to make the hole. I'm pushing the saw in and working along the line. If it starts to crack, I start again from a different point. I'm removing the dried flesh and seeds. If you've dried your gourds naturally in a cool place, the seeds inside will be viable. However, if you've dried them by a hot fire, you've probably cooked them. I'm putting some potting mix in the bottom of my gourd and then I'm putting in my plant. I'm using a succulent that doesn't mind growing in a light position inside for two reasons. Firstly, indoors my gourd won't get weathered by the rain. And secondly, succulents don't mind being on the dry side, so my plant is going to last longer. And now I've just got to water it in. Th 
there you go, a quirky homemade planter, which is absolutely gorgeous. Just as a cricketer must feel privileged playing a test at Lord's. For me, as a gardener, working here at the patch is like gardening in hallowed turf. Sharing my love for fruit and vegetables is a passion, a passion shared by someone else you'll remember, Peter Cundall. Well, as you can see, we still have the most massive job ahead of us, and yet we will create a garden here. And it'll be divided up into six separate beds. That'll give a six-year rotation system. You've no idea how happy I feel to be working in our lovely little organic veggie patch. Pete started all of this when he was host of Gardening Australia, a job he did for two decades that not only made him a household name, but loved throughout Australia. Recently, Evergreen Pete has had a 90th birthday. Hundreds of people have turned up here at the patch to celebrate it with him. It was the first time organic growing had ever been used exclusively for television. You and I have been making television for simply to share that information because the most important thing of all is if you can grow your own fruit and vegetables, that is your health insurance. Look at me, at my age, you know, nothing wrong with me. It's bloody marvellous to be healthy, right? And why? Organic pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you have so done much. incredible work over the years. And ABC Managing time. Director Michelle Guthrie was here for the celebrations. Here. I can't believe it. The boss has come to talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the way he's innovated in terms of his contribution to organic gardening before anybody was really interested in that was extraordinary. He's, he's a true innovator and a, and a, a true icon. Madam, you're going to have to leave Peter alone. We need him for the radio. <laughs> Chris Wisby has done talkback radio with Peter Cundall for more than 20 years. In every principle he adheres to, he will stick to it absolutely. He doesn't have fear or favour of any man, and he will stick to those principles till the end. And in the face of quite strident opposition at times too. He lives by the creed that he has set himself. If you eat the stuff that you've grown organically, I swear you live forever. It's as simple as that. And it tastes brilliant because it's full of all the nutrients and all the minerals that our bodies are often crying out for. <laughs> there it is. This is the joy of growing your own. And basically, that's what it's all about. It's the, the finest of all except You're bending and standing up and bending again, right? And what happens? You get all your muscles and all your working, right? And your brain and your, every now and then, you don't just stop and rest. You stop and gloat over what you've just done. You look at what I've just done that. That's brilliant. <laughs> what was the motivation of setting up the patch here at the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Gardens. A teaching thing. Some people think you can't go into the supermarket and buy a bit of garlic and plant it and grow it. Yes, you can. Here's proof that's where this lot came from. Since we started, almost all over the world and certainly all over Australia, schools, primary schools, have got their own veg organic veggie patches, right? And children are learning the most important and most creative thing that any child can learn, and that's how to create something, and that's growing growing something and planting something. Angus, my great pal, he's come all the way down from New South Wales and he's now living in Tasmania and he's blowing his blooming mind. I don't think there's ever been a, a more unique character on Australian television, in fact, in the ability to inspire generation after generation. Everyone relates to Peter. It kills only caterpillars and it's very safe indeed. Look, I must tell you this. What does it do to caterpillars? Well, it gives them the most terrible wind. And there's no greater music in the night than to lie in bed and to listen to tens of thousands of greedy caterpillars breaking wind as they die. So you've got to 90, where to from here? Oh, I'll never give up. I'm never going to retire, right? I mean, I do know that one day I'll kick the bucket 
I'll drop them dead, hopefully in the garden, and with luck they can open up the nearest compost heap and shove me in there, and I'll still be working. for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all of us. That's it for another week. If you want to catch the full interview between Tino and Peter, head over to our website. From all of us here at Gardening Australia, happy birthday, Peter Cundall. All hail the kale. Good on you, Pete. We'll see you next week. Hey, come with me. I've got something really good to show you. It is not often that you see a garden from the street that really excites you and you want to go and visit. Well, I'm going to be showing you what this garden's all about and I can hardly wait. I'm visiting my friend Cathy and looking at some of the exotic food plants that she grows in her garden that come from her homeland in Papua New Guinea. And I'm trying them. Netting like this is great for protecting your crops from birds and other critters. But there's a few things you need to know when setting it up. I'll be showing you some tricks, but that's just the start of the great gardening we've got for you next week.